This is Channel 7 Eyewitness News with Bill Butel and Diana Williams, Scott Clark with Sports, Sam Champion with the exclusive AccuWeather forecast, and the Eyewitness News team. Now, Eyewitness News. Good evening, I'm Bill Butel. It's a critical state, a crucial state in this presidential election, and today the candidates came back to New Jersey, a state that's voted Republican in every presidential race since 1964. It might not do so this year, but stumping in Newark at a union hall, President Bush tried to take advantage of history's favor while also trying to persuade Reagan Democrats to stay in the Republican column. Bill Clinton, meanwhile, swung through Madison, making an appearance at Drew University. With New Jersey's Governor Jim Florio standing at his side, Governor Clinton touted very, his health care and his economic programs. You know, this evening, it was off to Somerset for a major fundraiser, and Pat Dawson, our political correspondent, has the story. It was largely a coincidence of campaign timing. But there was Bill Clinton in Somerset, New Jersey tonight, and just up the road in Newark, President Bush. But the political version of a near miss was a perfect demonstration of just how important New Jersey is. At the Newark Union Hall, the president's pitch was economic. This is a trading state. One out of six jobs already depend on sales abroad. New Jerseyans know that. And the American worker never retreats. We compete and we win. But so hand in hand with the Republican pitch on the economy is an attack on taxes. And as the GOP national chairman none too subtly pointed out today, taxes in New Jersey means linking Governor Clinton to the unpopular Governor Florio. You had a big spending governor and a legislator to go along with him in Florio, and look what happened, almost three billion in new taxes. But the weak economy strategy, is clearly working strategy, for Bill Clinton in New Jersey. In new a recent poll gave him a 13-point lead here. The performance of the economy in the last three and a half years is the worst in 50 years. What makes New Jersey such an attractive prize for Clinton is that the heavily suburban state is a near perfect reflection of the Republican strength in presidential elections for the last 25 years. The Garden State has voted with the winner every time but one since 1960. It may not be absolutely certain that as New Jersey goes, so goes the nation, but that's not far off. It is very difficult to see how George Bush stays as president of the United States without winning the state of New Jersey. That's more than just the usual campaign rhetoric. Almost every scenario for George Bush's election this fall includes the 15 electoral votes of New Jersey. Matt Dawson, Channel 7, Eyewitness News. The debate over presidential debates moves to the bargaining table tonight. Members of the president's campaign staff arrived at the headquarters of the Commission on Presidential Debates in Washington. They are trying to work out a compromise with the Clinton campaign, and the GOP says the governor isn't cooperating. He's afraid of the president. He doesn't want to do it. He's, he's trying to come up with every reason. First, he wants a commission. Then he wants to go on Larry Ting Live. He'll be wanting to go on Arsenio Hall and a gun show. Again. Well, I think what we need to do is get on with it. So let's do the debate Sunday. Let's don't put it off two weeks. Let's do it Sunday. President Bush's plan calls for four debates beginning October 11th. Two would have a single moderator and two would have a panel of journalists. As you heard, Bill Clinton wants to get started this Sunday and he thinks a first debate could be held on CNN's Larry King Live. Governor Clinton adds he doesn't want the debates to conflict with major sporting events. And tomorrow is D-Day for Ross Perot. Close aides say the Texas billionaire will tell the nation whether he will return to the presidential race. Perot maintains his decision will be based on the will of the volunteers who told coordinators whether or not they will support Perot's candidacy. Bill? Away from politics for a moment. A great many students at PS2 in Jackson Heights, Queens got a day off today. They might have liked it. Their parents did not. The kids were kept at home because of a scare about lead paint chips at the school, which is near LaGuardia Airport. The Board of Education has tested. The results of the test are due tomorrow. The kids may or may not have another day off. Jada Dapper reports. It's worst on the ceiling of the girls' restroom on the second floor, peeling paint that contains lead. So tonight, parents came to PS2 looking for answers. Did the Board of Ed do a good job when it tried to fix the problems last weekend? And is the school now clean enough 
for their kids. There's going to be more testing going on in the next couple of days. Um, a, swipe, a sweep test is going to be done. That's over the dust around, laying around the school. And um, maybe an air test to see how high the level of lead is in the school. Are you satisfied that the school's safe until you see those results, or do you need to see those first? I need to see, I would like to see the results first before I let my child re-enter the school. Earlier in the day, many parents pulled their kids out of classes after getting a look inside the school. Look on the second floor hallway where there was a large piece of paint that was chipping. They painted over them. And the they ladies just painted over, over the chip. Bathroom. Didn't even take the chip painted. off. Painted over them. Others were upset about what at least one teacher was telling kids. Don't touch the walls. He tells the children while well, they in gym. They never tell the parents anything. The media was kept out of tonight's meeting because the Board of Ed said otherwise it wouldn't send a representative. The parents were joined by their city councilman, Speaker Peter Halone, who said the council is investigating the Board of Ed's handling of the citywide lead in schools problem. We're not casting judgments yet, we're just conducting an investigation and making sure that this particular school or any other school that has a similar problem is, is made safe for the children. It is widely acknowledged that PS2 is hardly one of the worst facilities in the New York City public school system as far as lead is concerned, but this incident does raise the question of how good a job the Board of Ed is doing when it comes to making sure the schools are safe for kids. In Jackson Heights, J.D. Dapper, Channel 7, Eyewitness News. And it's back to school for students at PS3, the site of a lead threat earlier this month. The school has been closed since then because of contamination, but tonight officials say it's safe to return. Anxious parents gathered tonight at IS70 in Chelsea as Board of Education officials explained what kind of work was done. But some parents are still worried. They say experts haven't been allowed to check if the lead paint was removed from the walls. I think that there are still some unanswered questions and, um, and I feel comfortable sending my child today. I don't know how safe the environment will be for how long. I have complete confidence in the UFT test results because I feel that they've treated this issue very seriously. Well, one parent says she plans to periodically test her child for lead. Bill? In this political and presidential year, everybody is talking about health care. Mayor Dinkins has stepped into the health care arena. He's promising radical reform for Medicaid patients, the people in poverty. Our new Medicaid managed care plan will revolutionize the way health care is offered to our poorest families. And that will be good news for the 700,000 Medicaid patients all the way from Harlem to Sheepshead Bay. Many of them tired of shortages of doctors, of long lines, of uncertain treatment. Families from a test section of Brooklyn will be required to sign up by tomorrow, but the program is available to residents elsewhere. The new plan will work very much like an HMO, allowing Medicaid patients to choose one of 13 well-advertised, well-known companies, including Blue Cross and Blue Shield, and it will keep them from using emergency rooms for their primary medical care. That, in turn, will save the city a great deal of money. Tonight, the mayor is getting closer to choosing a new police commissioner. Eyewitness News has learned that a search committee met with the mayor today and gave him a list of who it considers to be the most qualified candidates from the short list. Published reports say they include Acting Police Commissioner Ray Kelly, Housing Police Chief DeForest Taylor, former Transit Police Chief William Bratton, and former Deputy Police Commissioner Alice McGillian. No specific word yet as to when the mayor will make his decision. Diana? Well, three police officers from Newark, meanwhile, are free on bail tonight after answering charges stemming from the shooting of 17-year-old Howard Caesar. All three officers pleaded innocent at their arraignment in court today. The trio is accused of shooting and wounding the teenager after he allegedly stole a car belonging to another officer's mother. And when we come back, still another officer is making New York's finest very proud. Coming up, she is proud of her badge, but this woman in blue has another calling. Hear her inspirational story in a special report. And an unforgettable day for another officer whose very quick thinking saved some lives. We'll have that story when we come back. And a Florida campus rocked by a brutal crime when we come back. South Florida police say a National Guardsman brought in to help hurricane victims has confessed to three college campus murders. It happened at Florida International University. Police say Guardsman Stephen Coleman met three women in a bar and got them to give him a ride home. Police say all three women were stabbed to death. It's unfortunate that this uh, one Guardsman action has, uh, has uh, shed a somewhat a different light on what we're doing here today. And we're certainly appalled at what's happened with Police say Coleman once lived in the Bronx as recently as two years ago. He's charged with murder and with two counts of sexual assault that occurred after the stabbings. And in the Bronx today, there was an amazing rescue, and so it is the two people are safe tonight because of a construction worker who helped pull them from a burning building. 
Glenn Semioli was driving this backhoe to his construction job in Belmont when three police officers flagged him down. The tenement was on fire. People were trapped. Trapped, that is, until Semioli used the backhoe to lift the officers up to the window. We didn't want them to jump because if, if they jump, they're going to wind up injuring themselves. So with his cooperation and us, we, you know, would basically be able to pull them down. Both the fire and police departments are investigating that fire. Well, police officers are often involved in interesting cases, intriguing crimes, but we found one officer with an interesting story to tell off the job. She moonlights in the ministry, and she is one of New York's women in blue. Hi, how you doing? Barbara Williams walks a beat once a week in Brooklyn as a community affairs officer at the 90th Precinct. She knows the bank tellers, the store owners, and the would-be thieves. I know what it means if somebody leans their hand out too much, you know. You kind of know your area. But away from the mean streets of New York, Barbara Williams has a second career. It's a job where she puts away her gun and steps up to the pulpit. It is Sunday in New Jersey, and Barbara Williams delivers a powerful message to a packed house. Sometimes just to walk down the street and, and people see me in uniform and I'll stop and say, how you doing, sis? How's your day? Brother, how you doing? Some of them look at me kind of funny. Cops don't do that, but when the love of God is on the inside, what you wear on the outside doesn't matter. It's a foot stomp and hands clapping service where healing hands take the place of a nightstick and a Bible replaces the badge. She would have to wear a vest to protect herself out in the street and here it's like you're free. Barbara's work at the pulpit did not go unnoticed after she joined the police force. She became the only reverend detective in the New York Police Department, a title she says some of her fellow officers found hard to accept at first. It's enough that you, you have the nerve to be, call yourself a preacher. Why not call yourself a missionary, you know, but why do you have to be a preacher? And then to turn around and be a police officer, that's definitely not for a female at all. So I, I would get a lot of opposition, especially having been in the ministry already since the age of 14. She's now been on the force for 10 years and says both her chosen professions are quite different. Police work is her window to the real world. The ministry and her family help her put it all in perspective. When you constantly are in a situation where you, you're, you're called to disputes all the time or, or you go to a situation where five or six children have been shot, that, that, that wears on you. I mean, and unless you're not human, you're, you're gonna feel it. And every Sunday, she lets the bad feelings go as she helps others do the same. Great service. Barbara has some lofty goals in both of her careers, and one of them is to possibly one day become police commissioner. Big ambitions. Mm -hmm. And a big night for a former Met this evening. Coming up, Frankie V shoots for a no-hitter against a pennant contender, Scott Clark, with a story. And a star of the stage plays a little politics. Those stories more when we come back. With the presidential election just around the corner, efforts to get people out to vote are in full swing. Broadway stars Gregory Hines, Savion Glover, and the cast of Jelly's Last Jam were signing up eligible New Yorkers today outside the Virginia Theater. And I guess a local boy, formerly a local boy, did pretty well today, Scott Clark. Indeed, sweet music, Bill Butel from Frank Viola tonight. No hit ball and goose eggs galore coming against the Toronto Blue Jays, a team trying to wrap up. The American League East, we take you to Toronto. And here was the man of the night, Frank Viola. Pleaded with his manager to start because it mattered. Mattered against the Blue Jays. Their magic number three going in. Viola was on his mark. Allowed three walks, no hits through eight. Meanwhile, David Cohn, Viola's former mate with the Mets, allowed just one run in eight innings work. This pitch, one of the very few mistakes from John Ballantin. Solo shot in the fourth was all the Red Sox could muster. So it came down to this. Top of the ninth. Viola faces Devon White. It's a two and two count. Here comes the pitch and there goes the no hitter into the outfield. So now it came down to the win for Viola. Would he get it? Dave Winfield to the plate. Winfield with a little bouncer. Kelly Gruber makes a nice play here and Viola gets his first career one hitter. Here's how I felt going into the ninth. I'll in tell you what, I don't remember what I felt like. Uh, in 10 plus years in the big leagues, I think the furthest I've ever carried a no hitter was five and two thirds. So uh, each inning after that, it was like a new experience for me.
All right, one hitter for Viola. Yankees, they got back at the Indians tonight after losing two straight in Cleveland. No mistakes by the lake for the Yanks tonight. And Danny Tartable figured into this one. Top of the second, Danny Tartable says hello to Dave Malicki and goodbye baseball. Home run number 25, the Yanks never lost the lead either because ever steady Melito Perez was on the mound. Three hit ball through eight innings worked for him. Paul Sorrento just one of his victims. Yankees go on to win it four to two. Meanwhile, Seattle is leading over Milwaukee, six to one now in the fourth inning. The magic number for Toronto could be two if that holds up. As for the Mets, the seven game losing streak is over. The Mets are out of the cellar. What a night. We take it to Shea. What a night at Shea. Bundle the blankets if you got them. The Mets trailed 2-1 in the third, but there, let the gifts begin. Jeff McKnight earned the RBI single, but then Ruben Amaro couldn't play pickup. Another man came home. Five errors by the Phils in this one. The Mets were ahead to stay. Sid Fernandez settled down to hurl his sixth complete game of the season. 14-11 now, Sid. Mets win 6-2. Elsewhere, Chicago over Pittsburgh. Greg Maddox got his 20th win, and the Giants beat the Braves. Didn't matter. Well, the Nets have let restricted free agent forward Terry Mills go to the Detroit Pistons. Pistons had signed Mills to a five-year, $9 million-plus offer sheet. Mills, born and raised in the Detroit area, played college ball at Michigan, and it was just too much for the Nets. We were concerned that Terry really don't want to play in, in New Jersey, wants to play back in Detroit, and uh, he felt like that he would not have an opportunity to uh, become as good a player as he possibly could playing behind Derek Coleman. All right, exhibition hockey tonight. The Rangers hosting the there. Islanders. Score tied at one second period. It's Brian Leach's power play with the slapper beating Mark Fitzpatrick. Rangers go on to win it four to one. And tonight at the Hilton, a special night for one Louis Carnesecca, a special man. The man with the magic sweater while serving all those years at St. John's as head coach. Tonight that school honored him for his efforts. Well, I'll tell you, it's a wonderful evening. I consider myself very lucky for always having coached in New York City. When there's a party for him, as you can see, everybody's going to show up. And uh, he's just a special person. He's touched a lot of lives, and, uh, you know, everybody wants to be here for him. All right, Louis Carnes. Finally, George Brett, now two hits shy, playing California two for two tonight against the Angels. Brett now two shy of 3,000. I'm Scott Clark, Tip for Sports, folks. Thank you, Scott. Thank you, Scott. And get out those long johns. You're going to need them. Sam Champion, AccuWeather, and Jack Frost in a moment. Going once, going twice, gone. Tonight at auction, memorabilia from the life and the career of the screen legend Jimmy Cagney. Cagney's first pair of tap shoes from his vaudeville days were expected to bring close to $1,000 as the evening went on. For Mr. Roberts, his naval officer's cap, and maybe the highlight for bidders were the spats Cagney wore in the Oscar-winning Yankee Doodle Dandy. Ah, what a great show that was. Yes. Still remains a great show yep. after all these years. Memorable weather today. Yeah, cool. Like? And we've got some frost warnings, uh, frost and freeze warnings out for some portions of the area. Let's walk to the wall and talk about them and show you what was going on in Syracuse today. Can you believe it? The first snowfall of the season. And this is only the second time in the last 30 years that we've had a snowfall this early in the season in Syracuse. Also in uh, upstate Vermont, there was a little snow that way as well. Frost and freeze warnings again, northwestern Jersey, also Hudson Valley. Likely that some spotty frost will also be found in Fairfield County tonight. 46 degrees outside right now, relative humidity at 56. The winds are southwesterly at 7 miles per hour, 58-44 your split. Satellite picture will show you a couple of interesting things we need to talk about. Not only the clouds and light clouds that are around our, our area, it could keep frost from a good portion of the area, but some holes will develop in those clouds. Clear skies mean probably some patchy frost out there, so be careful about that. Two big cloud patches to talk about, one of them right on the edge of the screen. This is Tropical Storm Earl. We have a lot of viewers in Bermuda simply because they pick us up on the satellite there. Bermuda should be watching this storm carefully. Tropical Storm watch in that area as this storm continues to move east. I think we'll probably be talking about Hurricane Earl tomorrow off our coastline, heading a little bit to the south of Bermuda. Also, this large area of cloud sitting in the Gulf, we started talking about it first early this week. Now it looks like it is going to develop into something tropical. Likely we'll see another tropical depression sitting here in the Gulf off the Yucatan by tomorrow morning at some point. It is getting more and more organized overnight, so we'll keep a close eye on that for you. 40 degrees early in the morning. Take a look at the numbers all over town. You'll notice that north and west of the city those cool numbers are coming in that's why we've got those frost and freeze warnings out in some locations likely again some patchy frost out there tomorrow morning 58 degrees not very warm tomorrow yes far below where we would normally see it but it's a large area of high pressure it's pulling down a cold air mass and we're probably older well probably with the uh, core of this cold air mass tonight into tomorrow morning so after that temperature should start to warm up a little bit and another day of good amounts of sunshine
sunshine all over the nation tomorrow. One system slides toward the northwest. If you're traveling toward Portland, expect some showers that way. Just about everyone else gets sunshine. Remember, there are some weak clouds over to the north, but I think we get a pretty good-looking sunny day tomorrow, even though it's cool. 40 degrees, mostly clear and cold tonight. That's the low temperature in town, much cooler north and west. 58 tomorrow, sunny, breezy, and cools away to call it. Five-day plan shows this doesn't really snap until probably Friday 72, Saturday 75. Again, uh, we need to keep a watch on Bermuda just in case something more develops out there than it is there right now. Okay, thank okay. you, Sam, very much. Thank you, Sam, and that does it for this edition of Eyewitness News. Nightlight is next for Diana Williams, Sam Champion, Scott Clark, and all of us at Eyewitness News. I'm Bill Butel. Thanks very much for being with us. Till tomorrow, good luck. Be well. Good night. Yeah.